Hey guys, it's the VC Andrews Critiquer doing my first ever top 10 video. To start things off, let's talk a little bit about Rick Moranis' most famous film role. Okay, after that. A little before that, the one from Disney. Okay, now you're just being a smartass. Thank you, Wayne Slinsky and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Yeah, a lot of people are familiar with this blockbuster about how inventor Wayne Slinsky's shrink ray never works until his two children and their friends happen to be in the room, and accidentally dumps them out with the trash, resulting in the four half-pints having to find their way back through their backyard, which to them is as big as a jungle and twice as dangerous. And what do I think of the movie? The same thing a lot of other people do. The effects were absolutely astounding and hold up really well today. The drama and tension were really engaging and kept me on my toes, and the characters were... so-and-so. They weren't bland per se, they definitely had distinct personalities, they just weren't executed very memorably. But again, the effects and drama were more than enough to keep me engaged, and this movie is still a fond childhood memory for me. And a lot of people are familiar with the sequels Honey I Blew Up the Kid and Honey We Shrunk Ourselves. I personally have never seen either film, but I haven't heard the best things about them, so I really don't have much desire to. But sadly, not very many people are familiar with what I consider to be the best part of the whole franchise. Well, that one was good too, but no. I'm talking about Honey I Shrunk the Kids, the TV series. Yeah, I bet a lot of you are surprised that there was a spin-off series involving the Selinsky family, all played by new actors, having many more kinds of science fiction and supernatural misadventures. It's a relatively obscure series, but it shouldn't be because it is very good. Well, almost. Ironically, this show's biggest flaw was probably the movie's biggest strength, the effects. Yeah, I'm just going to say it, these are the worst special effects I've ever seen in my life. Even for 90s television, they're just pitiful. They make a cheesy B-movie look like a big-budget Marvel film. Oh my god. But thankfully, the show did have its own supreme advantage over the 89 film, better characters. The Selinskys are so much more memorable here than in the movie. They're snarky and funny, but also brave and mostly kind-hearted, and their distinct personalities from the film are executed much better here. Like Nick as the know-it-all nerd, Amy as the pretentious popular girl wannabe, Diane as the sane voice of reason, and a lawyer in this version, which is a lot of fun. And yes, I like Peter Scolari's Wayne Selinsky better than Rick Moranis's. Granted, Scolari plays him more as awkward than nerdy, but the writers gave him much better material to work with, so he makes a very fun and likable protagonist. The Thompson family isn't in this series, but the new characters are pretty good. There's Please Chief McKenna, who's basically a Jim Hopper prototype that often gets roped into Wayne's shenanigans. There's his air-headed girlfriend Trudy, who gets a few laughs. There's Wayne's somewhat greedy boss, Mr. Jennings, who often tries to exploit Wayne's inventions to less than optimal results. And the villains the Slinskys encounter are usually pretty intimidating. In my eyes, this is a criminally underrated series, and since no one else on the internet has given it the attention it deserves, I decided I would. So I'm going to be discussing my top 10 favorite episodes of the series. Which ones were most funny, most exciting, had the best effects, well, for this series anyway, or were a mix of all three. Honey, I made a list of the top 10 episodes of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, the series. Number 10 From Honey with Love And in case you're wondering, yes, all of the episode titles have the word honey in it. This episode is a James Bond homage, starting off with Wayne giving what appears to be a group of Japanese investors a tour of the company he works at, only for them to turn out to be spies there to steal the company's impenetrable metal for their new missiles. But thankfully, Canadian James Bond knockoff Dalton Pierce comes out of nowhere to save the day, with a little help from some of Wayne's inventions. Impressed with Wayne's inventing skills, Pierre and the agency commission him to help them catch a notorious criminal called Pierre Lebec, who's plotting a nuclear war. And said help eventually turns into him and his family doing it all when some of Wayne's inventions accidentally knock out Pierce and the only backup agents. I admit, I'm not a huge James Bond fan, but I do like a good Bond parody, and that's just what we get. Like, just listen to what Wayne's codename is. And you, Zelensky, will be P. 
P, I don't want to be P. That's like the worst letter ever. Can't I be Q? Intellectual property of the Bond franchise. <laughs> oh, man, I'm an inventor. I can just hear it. You know, let's get P on this. <laughs> Dad's P. <laughs> I may not be able to take the other Agent P seriously anymore, but kudos for making me laugh at toilet humor. But that's just the start of this episode's spy silliness. The Selinsky family has to infiltrate the supervillain family Gala to find info on Lebec's plot. That's just nuts how many little kids are being raised as supervillains. He's going to Harvard in the fall. Wow, he, he can't be more than six. He's going there to blow it up. And what's Lebec's evil plot? Well, first of all, I'm hiding his face because he turns out to be a surprise villain. I'm sure a lot of you will guess who pretty early on, but I don't want to spoil it for those who don't. But anyway, this dude's plan is to use the stolen nukes to blow up the moon to alter the Earth's climates and turn Canada into a tropical vacation resort. Yes, folks, this guy's willing to completely screw up the ecosystem just to have the upper hand in the hotel business. And what's the Bond villain trap he plans to dump the Selinskis into? A pit of wild moose that can turn carnivorous if deprived food for too long. Man, this guy makes doofenshmirtz seem sane. All this should seem really dumb, but it's just so bizarre you can't help but laugh your ass off. There's also a few spy gizmos that are still played for laughs, but are actually very fitting for a Bond setting, like a hat that makes its wearer look like a hot woman in a bikini, and fake cigarettes that are actually bombs. Those things will kill you. Yeah, the Bond satire in this episode is awesome, but if you're a fan of straightforward Bond stuff, there's a decent amount of that, too. We got computer hacking, action scenes, the hot chick dancing with the bad guy as a distraction, underwater driving scenes that actually have pretty decent effects by the show's standards. Even the name of the agent Wayne Hastra plays, Dalton Pierce, is a reference to two actors who have played James Bond, Pierce Bronson and Timothy Dalton. This episode's no Austin Powers, but if you're a fan of Bond parodies or just straightforward Bond movies, this episode is definitely worth a look. Number 9 Honey, I'll be right with you. Every show involving a super genius who discovered things like time travel, mutations, shifting the age process, and so on, has to have one episode where said genius expresses a firm disbelief in magic and supernatural forces. And this was this series episode. After demonstrating some supernatural-themed inventions at the fantasy convention at Gentech, Wayne, when questioned about his own opinion on the supernatural, says he finds it ludicrous and sarcastically says he'd microwave a real witch if he came across one, since there's not enough room in Matheson for both science and magic. But wouldn't you know it, the reporter questioning him was actually a witch in disguise who sees Wayne's comments as a threat and decides to show Wayne that she and her coven mean business. While I usually think the science fiction scientist refusing to believe in magic right in front of them premise is really contrived, and actually it still is here, this episode is just so much fun I had to put it on this list. The witches themselves, while blatant knockoffs of those from Hocus Pocus, are still really enjoyable. And you thought David Copperfield was a real sorcerer. <laughs> well, those eyes sure hypnotize me. Does this thing get the Disney Channel? I'm way into Doug. <laughs> He's smart and wise and bright in class, but now he'll look just like a way uncool dweeby kind of guy. It's free verse. And the ways in which they hex Wayne's family to show him who they're messing with are equally humorous. They make Diane only able to speak pig Latin, they have Nick spew out ping pong balls from his mouth whenever he speaks, and they turn every guy Amy's ever flirted with into a chicken. Either I just stepped on a ping pong ball or one of your boyfriends laid an egg. Todd. This makes for some great gags, even more so when the witches spread their hex to all of Matheson, and to think that after all that, Wayne still refuses to accept its magic. That is until the witches start hexing him. The downside, though, is that they only use a voodoo doll, and that's a lot less memorable than their other methods thus far, but that's really a minor nitpick. So what else is there to enjoy from this episode? Well, while the witches are mostly played for laughs, they actually do show a pretty intimidating side as well, mostly around the third act, though. There's also a lot of clever references to other witch-themed media. I love Bewitched. Does that count? They even misspelled my name. 
and give them credit, the effects in this episode are actually pretty decent by 90s television standards, and compared to their usual garbage effects for this show, that's saying a lot. I also love how the airheaded comic relief Trudy is the one who provides most of the witch smarts in this episode, that's a neat change in pace. And it's all topped off with an exciting climax of science versus magic. It's far from bewitching, but if you're looking for some good Hocus Pocus derived fun, you probably won't be disappointed. Number 8 Honey, it's gloom and doom. What's so great about this episode? Five words. Tom Kinney in live action. In this episode, Wayne's helping Gentech construct a device that will bring eternal happiness to everyone on Earth, ending war and crime forever. But Mr. Jennings has assigned the cheapest assistant the company could find to help him, Vlad, played by the man himself, Tom Kinney. Vlad may be a clumsy, eccentric nutjob, but his heart is in the right place, or so Wayne thinks. No, it turns out Vlad's the leader of a foreign terrorist organization wanting payback against all the polluting American cities that wrecked the environment of their home country. And they plan to do so by reprogramming Wayne's invention to blow up said cities. Oh, and Nick also wants revenge on this farm kid who's been framing him for pranks in school. But of course, this only makes things worse, so they become friends and help Wayne convince Vlad revenge isn't good either, as well as another message we'll talk about later, and all's well that ends well. Yeah, on its own, this isn't an especially unique episode, but Tom Kinney's performance as Vlad earned it a spot on this list, and I bet you're all wondering, is Tom Kinney just as funny and over-the-top in live action as he is in animation? And the answer is, yes, he certainly is. No more will our small countries have to suffer under the global warming excesses of the West. We will strike back! Now let's party like we have never partied before. <laughs> Vlad, I thought we were friends. Bosom buddies! No way! Although both shows are very good for Western TV bilge. Oh, thank you. And so are the other terrorists. No more will our fish wear gas masks. No more! No more will our birds hitch rides because the air is so hot! No more! And give them credit, there's a brief part where they made Tom Kinney legitimately intimidating. That is amazing. But there are still a few non-Tom Kinney moments in this episode that shine. Mr. Jennings is at his funniest here. You realize I am not paying these guys any overtime. And I love how the villain scheme is foiled just by Nick pulling the plug on the device. Sometimes pulling a fast one only means yanking out the plug. And while the revenge is wrong message is more than a little cliched, it is well done, and there's also a message about how you shouldn't use science to change things for worse or better. Yeah, Wayne realizes how he was just as wrong as Vlad for wanting to try and bring eternal happiness to the world. It should be people themselves that make the difference, and that's a relatively well thought out message. It may not be the most creative or engaging episode, but it's got some good stuff and living proof that Tom Kinney is just as funny in live action as he is in animation. <laughs> Number 7 Honey, it takes two to Mambo. Ever have an in-law you just can't stand? Well, Wayne certainly does with Diane's sister, Eleanor. She's a snobby, materialistic writer of relationship guidance novels in town for a book tour, and Diane has invited her and her assistant, Bubbles, to stay with them. And she immediately proceeds to make Wayne's life hell on Earth. When Diane promises what's implied to be an upgrade with their sex life, Wayne agrees to try and get along with her, and to do so, he invents a machine that will transmit the frequency of her brain waves into him in the hopes that they will be more on the same page while she's there. But Wayne moronically doesn't test out the invention first, so it ends up putting a bit more than just Eleanor's brainwave frequency into Wayne. It puts her entire brain into him, resulting in a split personality scenario. But of course, Eleanor's not going to miss her book conference, so she and Wayne try to puppeteer Eleanor's lifeless body. But wouldn't you know it, Eleanor's mobster ex is also in town, and he wants vengeance on Eleanor for leaving him. Or does he? 
Like the previous episode, this concept isn't especially unique on its own. We've seen someone having another person's soul inside of them as a split personality in media before, but having it be with an in-law you hate just makes it a comedy goldmine, especially when played by Peter Scolari. Yeah, he is a riot as Eleanor's split personality, and he switches between both characters so well, I almost wonder if he really was possessed. I warned you, T. I told you not to marry him, and to think you could have married Tommy Damiano! Tommy Damiano from high school? You said that wasn't serious. Wayne, it wasn't. Not serious for first hickey. Hello? I the security system hasn't been invented that can foil Zelensky technology. Oh, please. If this guy ever played a gay character, he'd win an Academy Award for it. Scolari's great acting also makes some other overly used gags in this episode feel fresh, like Wayne freaking out when he first finds out Eleanor is coming. And I thought Homer Simpson was scared of his in-laws, and there's a decent plot twist here too. Keep in mind, this is the only time I'm going into spoilers, and I'm only doing so because I only have so much material to work with here, so skip here if you don't want any spoilers. It turns out Eleanor's mobster ex didn't actually cheat on her or threaten her with revenge. Her assistant Bubbles framed him for it because he caught her embezzling money from Eleanor. And now Bubbles plans to use the device to put herself into Eleanor's body and steal her life. Usually I can spot the wolf in sheep's clothing a mile away in this kind of scenario, but they actually hide it pretty well here. The only major downside with this episode is that Nick is absent. I'm sure this was because his actor Thomas Decker was unavailable for whatever reason, but it would have been fun to see how he'd react to this scenario. But with the split personality fun this episode offers, all I can say is, move over nutty professor. Number 6 Honey, I'm spooked. I think the best way to describe this episode is if Roger Corman directed a mix of Poltergeist and The Exorcist. Diane comes home on a rainy Friday evening with a trunk from an antique collector as a thank you present for taking his case pro bono. The family opens it hoping to find jewels, but it seems all they got was jibbed. But it turns out what they instead got was the concealed spirit of an insult comedian from the Old West, wanting vengeance on all humanity for his untimely murder and starts doing horrible things. Like unleashing a short, only somewhat creepy clown, turning Nick into a plant, giving Diane the mental capacity of a five-year-old, possessing Amy in the third act, actually that is a pretty villainous thing, and helping out around the house a bit. So to fight off these dreadful Ed Wood movie horrors, Wayne calls paranormal investigator Professor Duck. What is it? Vampire bats? Zombie assassins? Oh, and there's also these two collectors of haunted objects who are after the trunk, but they're relatively pointless to the story. And before we go further, yes, this episode is just as stupid as it probably sounds, but that's what makes it so fun to watch. This is clearly supposed to be a homage to cheesy horror B-movies, and it's a pretty effective one. The Nick Plant puppet has a lot of corny charm to it, and it's almost as funny how unrealistically cool Nick is when he first turns into a plant. You do realize that this will probably scar my psyche for life. Hey, it still looks more convincing than the plant from the Corman Little Shop of Horrors. Seeing a grown woman act like a toddler and a four-foot clown who mistakes tap dancing for terrorizing are as funny as they sound, and possessed Amy is... Well, we'll talk about her a little later, actually. Even the non-supernatural stuff in this episode is a lot of cheesy fun. Professor Duck... I mean, the professor gives a pretty funny over-the-top performance. And the two guys after the trunk, though pretty pointless, do have a few good lines and probably the most obvious fourth wall joke in the entire series. If we leave right away, we should arrive there shortly after the next commercial. Yeah, the show had fourth wall jokes every now and then, but never this painfully obvious. But it fits in perfectly with that corny tone the episode is going for. The only thing in this episode that's somewhat legitimately scary is when Amy gets possessed. Sure, the makeup she wears is pretty limited, but it's still freaky looking, and Hilary Tuck gives a somewhat chilling performance as the ghost of the comedian. Although this head spinning effect is terrible, and not in the so bad it's good sort of way, it looks like a first grade Photoshop assignment that got an F. 
But aside from that, this episode is a brilliant tribute to the campy silliness of directors like Roger Corman and Ed Wood, and if you want some corny B-movie fun, this is definitely a place to look. Number 5 Honey, it's a billion dollar brain. What's this episode's main strength? Actually a lot of different things, so I'm going to go into detail with them after the summary. The episode starts with Wayne being invited into work with the guy who replaced Mr. Jennings briefly in the second season. Oh yeah, did I forget to mention that? Reveal that the estate of the deceased richest man in the world, Orson Hughes, is offering Gentech a billion dollars if Wayne can reanimate Mr. Hughes' brain. And Wayne is up to the challenge, not just on account of the money, but also because he knew Orson Hughes back when he was a homeless bum, and with the help of a cloaked assistant from the estate named Mongo, the experiment works. Only problem is, Hughes isn't satisfied and has Mongo empower his brain even more, giving him immortality and mind control powers. And not having any gratitude towards his old friend, Hughes decides he wants to steal Wayne's family for himself, brainwashing them to suit his tastes, and eventually sets his eyes on Wayne body. This episode has a lot of the same strengths of the last episode on this list, one of those being its many movie parodies. Mongo is a blatant and hilarious knockoff of Igor from Young Frankenstein. The children of the night. Yeah, right. That's her dog digging up our plants. You really need to start watching horror movies made past 1932. They still make horror movies? Slasher flicks. Oh, yuck! Disgusting! Hell, the scene where they reanimate the brain is a direct homage to the movie. It's alive! Actually, it's only bubbling! It's bubbling! It's bubbling! <laughs> the brainwashed Zelensky family references many movies, from the Stepford Wives, to Heidi, to Newsies, and maybe Caddyshack with the Jennings replacement guy. The mini-parodies bring some great corniness to the episode, similar to what made Honey, I'm Spooked so memorable, but even its original stuff is pretty funny. Like, there's this running joke where every time Wayne says a dramatic line, the agents who kidnapped him at the beginning play that intense score often heard in Spongebob. Okay, okay. Shoo. Come on, out of there. And while the evil brain is beyond fake looking, it just looks so goofy you can't help but enjoy it. It's clear that like in Honey, I'm Spooked, they were trying to make the best of their 50 cent effects budget and aim for a so bad it's good kind of vibe here. But the reason I placed this episode above that one is because I found the corny gags and effects here a little more memorable. Sure they were great there, but I just laughed a little harder here. Plus, Orson Hughes is not only a very funny villain, but he's also a pretty despicable one. I mean, he's not intimidating by any means, but he's a pretty big asshole, being power-hungry, sexist, and even willing to kill his friend who brought him back to life to begin with. If the last episode didn't bring some corny fun to your sophisticated brain, then this brain is certain to do it. Number 4 Honey, you drained my brain. Two episodes with the word brain in them in a row. Small world. Anywho, if you're disappointed by the lack of primarily dramatic episodes on this list, then you're in luck. Diane's been lacking confidence in her latest case defending a couple being sued by a mall Santa who was pissed on by their kid. Hey, I said this was a primarily dramatic episode, mainly because the prosecutor is a natural Perry Mason and everyone is mocking her behind her back. So, wanting to help out, Wayne lets his wife use the Selinsky Thinky Ring, a device that increases brain power that he's been testing on some ants. But had Wayne paid more attention to said ants, he would have noticed that the device turns whoever wears it into an intelligence-sucking power-mad vampire, and only finds this out after Diane's taken the ring to the trial and started her brain-draining spree. After a bit of a struggle, Nick's able to get the ring off his mom, but gets the ring stuck on him, turning him into a Family Guy Season 1 Stewie Griffin plotting to drain the brain power of all humanity and take over the world. This is definitely one of the darker episodes of the series. For starters, Thomas Decker's performance as Evil Nick is surprisingly intimidating. Sure, Barbara Allen Wood is good too, but it's more impressive for Thomas not just because he's a kid, but he was the kid who voiced Fievel in the straight-to-video American. American Tale sequels. Just watch these two performances back to back. If you don't help your friends when they need befriending, who will? 
penny for your thoughts, mommy. No, all of them. <laughs> when the days are too cold and the nights are too long. Alone at last. Just me and that fat, succulent brain. And in the climax, Nick goes full Stewie Griffin and actually tries to murder his own mother, deleting what he thinks is Diane's soul transferred into the computer. Not to mention that there's actually a sex scene between Diane and Wayne on screen. Sure, it's pretty delicate, and this is a TV PG show, but seeing these kind of things in something with Disney's name attached is just bonkers. But I think it's pretty bold of this episode to go into some more risque territory, because this makes it a lot more dramatic than most of the other episodes in the series. But while mainly played for drama, this episode does have some good laughs, too, mainly from those who have their intelligence drained out. Are you sure we should be doing this? Of course. What's wrong with stealing the intelligence of every man, woman, and child on the face of the Earth? Oh, is that all? I thought we were trying to get free HBO! <laughs> and it has one of my favorite lines in the whole series. That thing looks more like Rick Moranis to me. Who? You know, Canada's answer to Tom Hanks. Who? The Rick Moranis reference should be pretty obvious to you all, but the Tom Hanks line is a reference to how he and Scolari were co-stars on a series called Bosom Buddies back in the early 80s. If you're looking for something a bit more intense in this series that still has some comedy sprinkled in, this is probably an episode to check out. Number 3 Honey Who Done It. This was the series finale and what I call finishing with a bang, no pun intended. Wayne comes home to find the rest of the family lost in the world of reading, but doesn't find their books particularly revolutionary. So Wayne decides if the people who wrote those pieces of crap became millionaires from their work, imagine what he'd become writing his own novel. So he sets to write a detective story featuring himself as a sleuth named Wayne Wolf, who receives a visit from a woman bearing a resemblance to Diane, asking for help finding her sister who she claims was kidnapped by an inventor who died 150 years ago. Go. Wolf knows she's BSing, but takes the case anyway to find out what she's really up to, and soon finds that two criminals are after her for her future predicting device that she bought at a garage sale, and that a masked criminal also wants vengeance on him for cutting off his hand and ruining his music career. This is hands down the silliest episode in the entire series. Not only is the corny fun from previous episodes maximized here, with Wolf having a chimpanzee for a partner, and a hurricane taking place in the third act even though the location is nowhere near water, but this whole episode is mainly just a 45-minute stand-up routine and all of the gags hit bullseye. Sure, some are stolen from other media. What? Exactly. She was kidnapped by a man. What? I said she was kidnapped by a man. Yes. His name is what? <laughs> yes. What was his name? What? I said, what was his name? What is his name? I'm asking you! But most of them are original, at least I've never heard of them, and are just so well thought out. You wanna change your story, precious? Once upon a time, there were three little bears. Mama Bear and Papa Bear. Not that, I mean about the gorilla kidnapping your sister. Mr. Wolf was responsible for my accident. Is that why you wear a mask, sir? I'm talking about my book, you <laughs> idiot! I don't have a gun. This is a family show. Don't talk to the camera. Don't remember. You see, my family has this problem with short-term memory. How long have you had this problem? What problem? I hate my life. It helps with how goofy and over-the-top all the actors are with their performances. This episode really demonstrates how talented all these actors are and why I love their performances so much better than the ones in the movie. I also love that a guy would portray his own daughter as a deadbeat stick-in-the-mud secretary who hates her life. That's funny as hell. I don't know why I ever took this job. I had a great job as a bouncer. Preschool. There's even some clever plot twists regarding the masked villain and the Nick and McKenna criminals that I won't spoil for you, but I will say is foreshadowed through one of the jokes I showed you, at least for the latter two. All I can say is, it's too bad Wayne decides he's not cut out for writing at the end of the episode because this was just a comedy goldmine and a great finale to a great TV series. Number 2 Honey, I'm Dreaming, 
But am I? This is probably the best known episode of the series, and I bet a lot of you who are familiar with this show were expecting this to be number one on the list. And I totally understand why, because it is a very good one. There's just one other that I like a little better, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Having to dissect frogs at school has been giving Nick nightmares, so to help his son nut up, Wayne uses the Selinsky Dream Scooter to enter Nick's nightmare and help him conquer his fears. He succeeds, but soon receives a visit from the Master of Dreams Morpheus. No, not that Master of Dreams Morpheus. There we go. Who tells him that entering the dream world without going to sleep is a big no-no, and that there'll be trouble if he ever does it again. Wayne is willing to respect Morpheus' wishes, but Amy isn't too intimidated, and wanting payback on Nick for mocking her going out of the parameter study methods, decides to pay a little visit to Nick's dreams. But Amy soon finds she shouldn't have brushed off Morpheus so quickly, and now he's after the whole Selinsky family for defying his orders. This isn't necessarily the darkest episode, but it is definitely the freakiest. All of the imagery is like something out of the fever dream of a psychologist psychotic serial killer high on Walter White's meth. It's about as disturbing as a TV PG rating will allow. But that's what makes this episode so engaging. Sure, the imagery is pretty low budget, but the thought and creativity really show. Plus, Morpheus is everything you could want in a great villain. He's sarcastic and smug, but also creepy, foreboding, and outlandishly sadistic and cruel. It's more effective nightmare if despite your supreme best efforts, your family doesn't survive. I think a big part of why he's so intimidating is because he preys upon one's personal deepest fears, similar to why villains like Freddy Krueger and Pennywise are so scary. But while mostly played for scares and drama, this episode is not without a little humor. The scene where the Selinskis are trying to stay awake to avoid Morpheus while Wayne tries to invent something that'll keep them awake forever is pretty funny, especially when topped off with probably Wayne's most embarrassing failure to test an invention before using it. One blast from this baby and you'll never sleep again. <laughs> Did I have it in reverse? I think every stupid thing about this scenario speaks for itself. And in the third act, Morpheus has Amy take his own special PSAT as kind of a chess for life game to save her family that's mostly played for drama, but does have this hilarious scene of Amy turning the tables on old Morphe by going out of the parameters of the question. Only to find yourself now standing before her classmates, stark naked. This situation was A, insouciant, B, mortifying, or C, ironic. C, ironic, because I've told everyone that this style is straight from the VH1 Fashion Awards. And they bought it. Plus, that's a very good message. Sometimes doing things by the book sucks, and thinking out of the box can be just as effective. So yeah, this episode's a real gem. It has a lot of twisted fun imagery and a twisted fun villain to conquer. I just wish they had brought Morpheus back for something better than being the host of the series clip show. And the number one Honey, I Shrunk the Kids episode is... Honey, We're Young at Heart. Now just as a heads up, you might be confused as to why this is my favorite episode after hearing the summary, so just hear me out. The Selinskis feel bad for their neighbors the McGanns because their age is starting to catch up with them, so Wayne and Diane selflessly offer to transfer a little of their youth to them with the new Selinsky Zip Enhancer. But as usual, Wayne doesn't test the invention before using it, and the device transfers a bit more of their youth than they planned. So Wayne and Diane find themselves aging rapidly, and the McGann's de-aging rapidly, and have only 24 hours to fix things before the former die of old age and the latter cease to exist. On top of that, the McGann's aren't willing to give the youth back without a fight. So yeah, at first glance, this probably doesn't sound like an especially unique episode. Hell, it might not even sound unique enough to be anywhere on this list, so why did I put this as number one? Well, two big reasons. One is its technical achievements. The old person makeup and prosthetics on Barbara and Peter are absolutely astounding, not just by this show standards or even 90s television standards, but for special effects makeup standards in general. Yeah, would you believe that's actually still Peter Scolari and Barbara Allen Wood as Wayne and Diane? 
The actors in the Megans also wear great makeup for when they're old at the start and when they become teenagers and seven-year-olds. Okay, I'm just kidding about that second part, but the old age makeup part is true. It's just so jarring to see effects like the stop motion hack job in the same episode as these amazing Jim Henson level prosthetics. And then there's reason number two, the tone. Most of the episodes in the series were either primarily funny with a little drama sprinkled in, or primarily dramatic with a little humor sprinkled in. Not only does it feel like an even 50-50 here, but it's also some of the best in the entire series. On the comedic side, we have Old Wayne, who is one of the funniest characters I've ever seen when he starts growing senile. What kind of a fool do you take me for? How many kinds are there? Very soon! Moon? What moon? Every minute now, we'll be seeing our little Wayne. I don't think so. There's not a cloud in the sky. There's one line that's especially funny in hindsight. I'll never see the new Star Wars movie. Yeah, I don't think that would have been a huge loss, Wayne. There's also a few other good laughs that don't come from old Wayne. No wonder Joe at the cooler didn't flirt with me today. <gasps> Who? I've got to get me one of those. But the drama is also some of the best in the series. This certainly wasn't the first time someone in the family's been in danger of dying, but they treat it a lot more grave and severe here than usual, and I think I know why. We all die naturally of old age eventually. It sucks, but we can take comfort in knowing that the natural process of death happens over a long period of time for most people, and that you can still enjoy life for a while. And sure, people can get in accidents or have disease and stuff, but to die by some Something that shouldn't happen for a long time just feels like you got scammed by nature. So that's why this type of threat feels a lot more grim, and the characters really convey the agony over it. Aside from that hilarious Star Wars line, the scene where Wayne and Diane are lamenting all the things they won't be able to do or see in life is really tear-jerking. So are all the times that Amy and Nick are scared they're going to be orphans from being ripped off by the natural order of life. And it's topped off with this gut-wrenching scene when they're about to give up trying to catch the half-pint McGann's and see their parents off to the afterlife. Go get him, Amy! Go get him! It's no use. It's time to go back. No! Come back! Where are you? Come back! Nick! Nick! It's over. We should be in with Mom and Dad right now. No! It's time to say goodbye. Of course, the McGanns have a change of heart, allowing the series to continue for another season and a half, but this is still one of the most intense and well-acted scenes in the entire series. So yeah, that's why I think this is the best episode. It has the best effects and a 50-50 tone of the comedy and drama that made this series awesome, with some awesome performances to deliver it. I also really liked the cute ending where the McGanns still decide to act young and Scolari and Wood's rendition of Moon Over Miami. Balloon! A macaroon one. And that was my top 10 episodes of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, the series. My final thoughts? Really just this. Why can't Peter Scolari play Wayne Selinsky in the upcoming Honey, I Shrunk the Kids reboot? He did so much better. But before I go, I'm going to do something I've wanted to do since I was six years old. When the rules need breaking, who will... Stop singing! Yeah, I always wanted Shrek to come in and stop the terrible singing of those mice, and now I got my wish. Bye, guys!